It's the Farmer to Farmer podcast, episode 70, and this is your host, Chris Blanchard. Janet Zarnicki raises five acres of vegetables, flowers, and fruit at Redwood Roots Farm on the northern California coast, just outside of Arcata. Almost all of her produce is sold through her CSA, with the remainder sold through her on-farm farm stand. In this episode, Janet shares how she has developed a year-round CSA farm serving 160 shareholders in the summer with pickup on the farm, and a UPIC winter CSA program that has her customers out in the mud harvesting their own vegetables in the mild but rainy coastal climate. Her summer CSA also includes a UPIC component, and Janet gets into the details of how that works as well. Janet puts significant effort into creating reciprocal relationships with her customers, her employees, and her community. We discuss how she has worked with her CSA members to finance the farm and the infrastructure, how she uses a structured give and take with her employees to encourage them to engage in the farm, and how she manages a significant engagement with her local community through food banks and community education. We also discuss how she manages a completely off-the-grid operation, her minimally mechanized production systems, and how she coexists with the Simphalans on her farm. I had a great time talking to Janet. I really could kind of feel that cool coastal Northern California climate while we were while we were having our conversation. And I loved hearing the birds singing in the background while we were recording it. I hope you enjoy this conversation just as much as I did. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is made possible with the generous support of Vermont Compost Company, founded by organic crop growing professionals committed to meeting the need for high quality compost and compost based living soil mixes for certified organic plant production. VermontCompost.com. This episode of the Farmer to Farmer podcast is brought to you by BCS America. BCS two-wheel tractors are versatile, maneuverable in tight spaces, lightweight for less compaction, and easy to maintain and repair on the farm. Gear-driven and built to last for decades of dependable service. BCSamerica.com. Janet Zarnicki, welcome to the Farmer to Farmer podcast. Thanks, Chris. It's great to be on. I'm so glad you could make this work today. Thank you for making the time. Yeah. So I thought it would be interesting to start by talking about where you are, because your farm, Redwood Roots Farm, is located right outside of Arcata, California, right up in the northwest corner of the state. That's correct. We're in between Arcata and Eureka in Humboldt County on the coast, and we're about we're way in northern California, so we're about... I don't know, 70 miles from the Oregon border. There's just one county north of us before you hit Oregon. And the farm itself is located in a beautiful little valley, the Jacoby Creek Valley. And uh, we're in a beautiful spot where the coastal range frames our view. And along the south side, we have a uh, creek, Jacoby Creek, with a beautiful riparian zone and... um, yeah, it's right. Uh, we have coastal influence. Uh, we're only about three miles from the ocean as the crow flies. So we have very cool weather year round. And uh, it's just a beautiful, beautiful little valley that we're in. And is it a pretty rainy climate there? During the rainy season. So from October through April, it's usually pretty rainy. Of course, we were, did experience some drought the last few years, although this last year was uh, average amount of rainfall. And we didn't have as much drought as further south in the state. So yeah, we do. Um, this area on the coast averages 43 inches a year of rain. During the summertime, what kind of a pattern do you do you run into for rainfall? Is it turn really dry? I know I grew up in Seattle and sometimes, you know, well, people are going to, I might get hurt by for saying <laughs> this, but, you know, sometimes you can go in Seattle for you know, weeks and weeks and weeks without it actually raining in the summertime. Yeah, we consider it a dry season. So we might get a rain occasionally once in June or once in July, but there's no appreciable rainfall really during that time. It is foggy because we're on the coast and some summers are really foggy and some summers aren't foggy. Um, At the moment, it's foggy, which I really enjoy. It starts the morning out a little slower. It's cooler. I don't have to water as much. So we do have that summertime fog, but it generally burns off by 10 or 11. And Redwood Roots Farm is, you have about 10 acres of land, right? That's correct. Yep. It's a 10 acre parcel. And you're farming how much of that? Half of it. Half of it. Okay. So five acres, mostly in vegetables. Flowers, herbs, and berries, but mostly veggies. Yep. Okay. And how are you selling that product? 90% I sell through an on-farm distributed CSA and I also have a farm stand twice a week on site, and I sell to one restaurant who comes here to pick it up. Oh, how nice! Yeah. So you don't you 
don't have to leave the farm very often at all if you don't want to. No, I don't, except I don't live on the farm. So I do go home every night. Oh, interesting. How far away from the farm do you live? Mm, two miles. Oh, okay. Yeah. So nice, easy commute. Oh, yeah. Why don't you live on the farm? Well, the people who I bought the land from, June and Bill Thompson, uh, they bought this land with the intent of conserving it. So they restored the creek, which was bare, essentially. And now it's just, you look over and it's all trees. So they did a big restoration project on the creek. And they were really concerned about um, farmland being lost in the United States. And so they put a conservation easement on the property. And at first they said no buildings, but then they came to realize that farms need buildings. So they said no habitable buildings. Now the the plus side of that for me is it's what allowed me to buy the farm because it was quote valued at less. So I was able to buy the property because it didn't have a building site. At this point in my life, I'm happy to go home at the end of the day. If I lived here, I would be working nonstop. So I'm, I like the separation of my work and my home life now. I go home to be restored. And I, if I lived here, it would be very difficult. Also, um, a plus side is the farm is open. There's no closed times. So people can come here anytime. So we have neighbors walking their dogs down the creek. We have people coming, bringing their kids to look at the chickens. We have people just walking in the field at any time, any day. And I really like that the farm is open and accessible to the community. That's part of, of our mission. You know, when I had a farm, I, I was actually kind of, a, I liked the fact that my farm was located in the middle of nowhere. I mean, we were 20 minutes out of town, outside of a small town and three miles down a gravel road uh -huh. to get to our place. And, and I just, I love that because the last thing I wanted was people coming onto my farm. Um, it was, it was bad enough that I had employees who, who showed <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, just, I, I you know, I, I can be kind of private like that. And, and it's really interesting to me that you've, that, you know, you've kind of got the opposite for a, for a model of, of how you present yourself publicly. Yeah. If I lived here, it would be different, but I don't. So I really like that aspect that it can be open and accessible to anybody at any time. You're pretty close to Arcata, we're, right? Yeah, we're three miles from the center of the town. Okay. So do you, I'm just curious, do you actually live in town? Uh-huh. Yeah. Huh. Okay. And Arcata's a pretty small community, and you're not that far from Eureka either, and Eureka's not that much bigger. Oh, Eureka's quite a bit bigger than Arcata, and it is also the biggest town in the county. What kind of an urban population are you looking at between um, those two well, communities? Ar Arcata, I think, is around... I think Arcade is around sixteen or seventeen thousand, but then we have there's a university there, Humboldt State University, and that's you know seven thousand in addition. And then Eureka, okay. I believe, is around forty thousand. Oh, so you've got a pretty sizable urban contingent to draw from for uh, your customer base. Urban might be going too far, but yeah, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's not well, exactly urban. It's uh, Northern California urban. Yeah, you know, uh -huh. yeah. Okay. And, and how many, with that 90% of your business being made up with the CSA, how many members does, do you have in your CSA program? Well, we're coming into the main season share, which is the biggest, and we have 160 shareholders. They all come on site, come to the farm to pick up. And then during the winter, we have a UPIC program and where it's only UPIC, which I love because I winter income, but I don't have to do anything. And that is 90 shareholders. And then we just finished up a very small spring share for just eight weeks. And that was 50 shareholders. So not a huge number, but that one, that 160 seems to be one of those places where CSAs settle a lot of times at a membership level. For five acres, that's good. And it's also a, a number I can remember everybody. I can see them. I know their name. I try to greet everybody by their name. So uh, it, it works for me. The number's just right for me. You said you're doing the you pick in CSA in the wintertime. Can you tell us more about how that works? Sure. Yeah. I uh, found uh, – how it started was because we have such a mild climate, some of our crops at the end of our main season would continue to live in the winter. So I would welcome people to come who had been shareholders during the main season to come and pick. And then I realized I could make a whole share out of it. So I started to sow and plant with that in mind. Um, we sow and plant in June and July and August and everything's weeded by the time the 
the the UPIC share starts in November. So it's a five month share, and we have you know a lot of different brassicas, a lot of the different greens, a lot of the different roots, um, lettuce and spinach at the beginning, bok choy. So there's quite a few vegetables, which of course that number wanes as we get close to. March. But uh, yeah, it's 90 shareholders. I do an orientation. I show them how to pick. I mark all the beds with an orange flag. When they come on to harvest, everything's labeled. Um, I have the tools ready for them. I show them how to wash the tools. And then they're on their own. I train them about the gate. Uh, I do an extensive training. It still gets a little goofy, but it is winter. So I tend to be looser in the winter myself. And uh, people can come anytime, any day and take what their household uses uses for the week or the day if they're coming every day. So, which most people don't come every day, but, um, a good number come once a week, um, on a schedule. So it's uh, a lot of people or some of the people only do winter you pick because they just love that it's quiet. There's no one out here. They rarely see anybody else. Uh, and they're doing it themselves. Other people want to skip the mud. They want us to wash the produce. So it just depends. But I find it really um, is important for some of the shareholders. So I, it's a really important um, winter income for me, too. It, it's worked out really well. You said that folks come at a scheduled time. Or do you have blocks of time when people are supposed to come and do that harvest? Or is it just that that's their own schedule? That's their own schedule, which they really like. They love setting up and coming when they want to. So we have certain people that they come every Monday because it's the beginning of the week and they're ready to go. And then other people come and go whenever. It's it's. But from my perspective, the what what I've set out is it's open any time. And you said that people are harvesting all of their own crops. So it's not like you're storing carrots and bringing them out once a week and washing them. They're actually out there picking those? Well, the, because we get so much rain, they rot. So I do. I have storage potatoes, storage winter squash, and storage carrots that I distribute over time. But they're already all washed. But there's other crops that, that people are out there digging out of the ground and cutting off of the plants. Yes, Everything. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I should have more faith in my fellow man, but I just, I. <laughs> yeah. A lot of funny stuff happens, but um, this year I was really strict that everybody come to orientation. And then I just was very firm about things. And I think it got the message across because this year, this last winter, there was a lot less goofy things going on. Like what kind of goofy things would go on? <gasps> oh, they top the kale. Uh, they take their beet leaves that they're leaving and put them right on top of a living plant. They, um, well, people routinely get stuck in the mud in their boots. Uh, just funny stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> just funny stuff like that. I think, I think about that, you know, Pacific Northwest rainy season winter. And I mean, it, it is, if you, if you haven't been in that area in the wintertime, I think it's sometimes it's hard to imagine just how wet it gets, yeah. but you basically end up in a situation where a lot of that soil is pretty much liquid almost all winter long. Well, I, our field has different zones, of course. So all of our winter, most of our winter you pick is in the drier part of the field. And tell me a little bit more about the kinds of crops that you're doing for winter you pick with, with of course the, the caveat here that. I think in in Arcata, you're not dealing with a whole lot of freezing temperatures. That's correct. And everything we have out in the field can take the frost because we do get some frost. So what we we have a lot of brassicas, of course, char, I mean, um, broccoli, it's sprouting broccoli, cauliflower, kale, cabbage, um, then charred collards, beets, fennel. There's lettuce and spinach at the beginning. We did parsnips for the first year, which didn't rot, which I was really happy. We'll have turnips. Um, I don't know. There's like 15 crops. That's a really nice selection. Yeah, it is. It works out really well. Of course, they're all the varieties for winter. It's a whole different set of varieties than what we grow during the main season. And are those varieties that you're sourcing from the same seed companies that, that we're getting stuff from here in the middle of the country? Or are you guys, do you guys focus on more regional stuff for that? My main seed companies that I use for the winter, it's Osborne and Johnny's. And then I just love Johnny's. I've been buying from Johnny's forever and just have nothing but good things to say about Johnny's. So. Great. I know I, I agree with that. And Osborne's a great company yeah. too. I don't know if you, I'll just, and I, I will plug that they've been sponsors of the Farmer to yeah. Farmer podcast in the past. Yeah, they so, have wonderful, uh, great varieties for overwintering. 
the summer CSA then changes for you. You're not having people just come out into the fields and pick stuff whenever they want. Right. We have a, a schedule. So, and I call it main season because it's also goes into the fall. So it's June through October. It's a 22 week season and uh, they come out either on Wednesday or Thursday. I set it up so they don't have to tell me which day they're coming. Uh, if they miss out on Wednesday, they can just come on Thursday. And of course I have hours because, you know, we're harvesting and get it out at a certain time. And uh, that's the 160 shareholders. Generally, it's split evenly between the two days. Uh, and we have all the in the beginning, you know, we have what what we have now is mostly like spring type crops. But our zucchini is starting to come on. And then by August, all our hot crops will be on, which go into the fall. And then because we're on the coast, we have brassicas year round. Oh, and then I do I it's. I do do a U pick during the main season. We used to pick charred kale and collards for the shareholders, and it would take hours to pick as many greens as we needed because people around here are nuts about their greens, and there's a lot of juicers, and I almost can't plant too many greens. And so because it took us so long to pick the greens, I just thought I'm going to plant them close to the CSA shed and have them be U pick. So at this point, all the greens are U pick, uh, the flowers are U pick, the culinary herbs are U pick. If someone isn't able to U pick because sometimes people have an injury or they have a little baby or a toddler. So we do offer assistance where someone who, from my crew, um, I'll have them working in the flower garden, which is really close. And I'll just give a shout out and they'll go and harvest for whoever needs help. So it's, it's not to the exclusion of the people who can't you pick. We definitely offer an opportunity to pick for them if they can, but most people can do their own you picking. So they, people tend to love you pick. In fact, we started the flower garden as a you pick because people weren't going into the field they just come and get their vegetables and leave and i really wanted to have interaction with uh the plants and the shareholders and the you know the whole nature aspect of it so i thought i'll put a grass circle in the middle and put some flowers out and sure enough it got people out in the field and now on a share day i look out and everywhere i look in the field there's people walking around and picking and enjoying the field and being up close and personal with the plants so that's something that really brings joy <laughs> it's one of the reasons i'm doing what i'm doing and so um it's been very successful to have the you pick so people are coming to the farm are you distributing boxes or do you guys have a market style pickup well we have kind of we don't do boxes because that's so much labor and we did them the first year and i thought no they can you know if everybody's packing their own box that makes a lot more sense to me and so uh we have it all laid out with something on the board that says what to take we actually have the boxes labeled as well and then i did something which i call the bonus table which is in the middle and this is where i put grade b where i put things that are just coming on um, the bed's just coming on and we don't have enough for everybody or it's going out of production. I'll put that on the bonus table. Uh, last year, we had so many cucumbers. I just put the cucumbers on the bonus table because people could take as many as they wanted. So the bonus table really offers a lot of choice for people. And that's where they really get to, you know, uh, customize their share. And it's very easy for me. I just it's I don't count anything out. I just put it on the bonus table. And uh, it, people really love that. It really adds to what they get on the share what I call the share proper. And I'm really interested in this, in the you pick thing, you know, <laughs> you know of course, yeah, you know, this, this, this is where I kind of focus on those things that would just drive me crazy if I had done them on my farm, which is nice that there are a lot of different kinds of people out <laughs> yes. there. But, but I mean, so I, I mean, you mentioned that you have like juicers who come and, and are, are wanting kale. Now I've started doing some juicing lately. And I mean, you know, we go through an incredible amount of greens yeah. when you do that. And so, do you guys have controls over how many bunches of kale somebody takes home or is it just kind of like come and get what you need? Come and get what you need for the greens. I mean, I've planted to address the needs of the juicers. So I have about 10, 100 foot beds of greens and they they love it. Like some people get a trash bag full of greens and I've had to ask them. I'm like, are you really using those all yourself? She's like, yep, I juice them. I eat them all. So. Yes. As a current juicer, I can vouch for that. Yes, yeah. they're using them all. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. It works really okay. well. Um, I, I've, I've tossed around the idea of just having a juicing chair where people who juice can just come and get greens. But that I try to keep things simple. So that would complicate things. So I'm, I don't think I'll do it. I've just tossed the idea around in my head. I mean, it sounds like you've got a lot of trust and a lot of give and take mm -hmm. with your CSA members. Definitely. Is that a 
And and how did you develop that? It did take time. Um, you know, when I first started the farm, I, people around here didn't really know what CSAs were. So I did a lot, a lot of education through newspaper articles and slideshows. And we had events here and I did a lot, a lot of outreach. And, you know, that grew because people would learn about it. They become shareholders. They love it. They tell their friends. I do no advertisement now. I fill up before the share even starts. So we're, we're doing really well. I really like people. And so, and I'm very interested in people. So I've gotten to know my shareholders and um, new shareholders. I make sure I learn their name and their kids' names or their mom's names. And uh, people, you know, it's, um, I'm always around for the distribution two afternoons a week. And I really like engaging with with people and hearing what's going on with them. And it's a very peaceful place here at the farm and people really, you can see them let down, your shoulders go down, they relax, they talk slower, they walk slower. There's a little bit of a walk from the parking lot to the farm. And I think in that uh, 300 feet, they really can relax um, coming down here. So it's a whole different, there's a feeling here that people get that I think adds to why they like it here. It's a, uh, it's beautiful. It's quiet. There are birds. We have lots and lots of birds because of the creek. Well, and I actually, I just want to interrupt you just okay. a bit because I don't know if people can hear it, but I think those are birds that I'm hearing through your microphone. <laughs> yes, they are. I'm outside. Okay. I'm at the farm. Yeah. I just love that. I do too. Yeah. So I, yeah, I've made an effort to get to know everybody and conversely, they get to know me too. So there becomes kind of a loyalty and I've been very open when I've been having issues and problems. Um, we uh, our pump broke down one year right during planting season, and I was very open what was going on and how that impacted the farm. I got a loan from one of the shareholders to buy a new one. Uh, the shareholders have been very supportive in times of need and not need. Um, in general, they're very, very supportive. And so it's a very strong, mutually beneficial relationship. And I think that lends itself to good shareholder retention because we have great reten retention rates. You know, I've read a lot about how people are losing shareholders and their retention rates are going down. But I've found the opposite, um, that it's just gotten better every year. And I think a lot of that has to do is because I, I do spend the time getting to know people. So uh, that, you know, I care for them. They care for me. And it, it's really it's really uh, um, I it's one of the best things about doing the CSA for me. It's a theme that has, has come out over the course of doing the interviews for the farmer to farmer podcast. And something that I, I had observed before as well, you know, on my farm, we really had what I think of as a customer subscription agriculture. Mm -hmm. You know, people, people bought a box of vegetables. I delivered those vegetables to the city that was a, quite a ways away from the farm. And, and, People, you know, we had a lot of happy people, but it didn't really ge engender a whole lot of of loyalty. We had some communication, but, you know, we were dealing with fairly high turnover most of the time, even though we had very high quality produce. People seemed very happy. Um, and I certainly had my my loyal core, but we didn't really de develop those kinds of deep, sustaining relationships where there was a lot of give and take throughout the year. And I think when I as I've talked to folks in the podcast, it's something that keeps coming out is that the farms that have really embraced the CSA model as a community of support right. for the farm right. and, and, and a place where that that's also given back is really, I don't know. I, I, I feel like that's, that's something that redefines the portion of the food system that those people are engaging in and really does provide a source of stability. That is what I think CSA is, is one at least one of the things that CSA is supposed to be about. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. We have a very, very strong community support and identity. And I think you guys, I mean, you have that community support with, with your CSA. Now, I think you also do some other outreach with your food, right? We do a lot. Yeah. That's just kind of who I am. Uh, and so we've had a lot of involvement with the community through different collaborations with the food bank, with the Humboldt County Office of Education, with HSU, the university, with the community college, with uh, Community Alliance with Family Farmers. We have a local chapter. So we're, we have our fingers in lots of different places, but it's definitely a collaborative effort where I'm working with people from these, these organizations. And you have time to make that happen. <laughs> uh, 
It's hard. Uh, I'm not a meeting person and most of the organizations, you know, have lots of meetings. So I'm not a meeting person. So I try to set it up so that we're, I maybe have one meeting and then that's enough to set it up so that Humboldt County Office of Education can bring a van full of kids out every week to do a garden walk and make a recipe and eat it in the kids' garden. So um, if I didn't have really strong, wonderful partners in these organizations, I couldn't do it. So it really is dependent on um, how great the people are I'm working with. Can you go a little bit more in depth about some of the projects that you're doing outside of just giving people vegetables for money? Sure. Uh, Well, we have a really strong food bank in the county. Um, food for people and they have lots of different kinds of programs but one of the programs is a gleaning program and so if we have any extras or before I till in a crop they will come out and glean which is awesome Uh, sometimes we pick for them but they'll still come out and uh, pick up the vegetables for us so I don't have to make a delivery so that's a huge service and service for me the farmer and service for the people who are getting the food that's a really important relationship on a lot of different levels for one it gets food to people that maybe wouldn't get it otherwise, fresh vegetables. And uh, it's just a wonderful, the people I work with there are wonderful. Um, can, can you tell us a little bit about how the logistics work behind that? I mean, you said you guys have a really strong food bank program, which I know not everybody does right, right. in their community. But I also know from having having done work with food banks on my own farm and when I worked for other farms, it's not necessarily like something that's that's just as smooth as you would think it would it could be well it is here part of it has to do with the woman who runs the gleaning project uh laura hughes and she actually used to work here she was an intern and she worked here so i know her i have a relationship with her and she's all i do is i call her and i said i say i have extra zucchinis and cucumbers can you pick them up in the next couple days she'll say she'll say i'll be there tomorrow afternoon and she's here and she picks them up they do all the loading i don't even have to lift it for them I I do help them, but I don't have to. I I cannot be here even. She knows where to get them. And if I need something in the field, I just, they bring their own tools and they go out to the field. I show them the bed and they bring their own boxes and they load up the lettuce or whatever it is, cut and load it up. And it really, you know, like I said, it's because of the people I'm working with. Laura's really organized and it's really easy for me. She makes it easy for the farmer because she knows from personal experience how busy farmers are. And and you must be giving them a significant volume of produce in order for it to be worth their while to to have that kind of make it easy for you um, approach. Yeah, I have hundreds of pounds of zucchini and cucumbers for sure. It's it's a lot when I call them. It's the height of the season when I call them usually. You mentioned a program where you've got students coming to the farm to learn about the vegetables, maybe do a little bit of harvest, do a little bit of cooking. Do you do some other education and classroom things on the farm as well? Yeah. For years, we had community classes. I uh, had a one year I built a classroom on the property on the farm. It's a beautiful Very simple building, but very beautiful inside. Looks over the field. And so we did community classes on the weekend. We did anything from flower arranging to the politics of food to bird watching to soil science. And we did that for about three years, but um, it (laughs) it did not make any money at all. And so we decided to do, you know, community education in other ways. But it was really like a good trial for us in three years, you know, something. And then, um, we worked really closely with community Alliance with family farmers. We have a local chapter and someone who used to be an intern. And then on crew here, she started, I had mentioned to her when she finished her crew position that there was an awful lot of need for on-farm education with kids because I get a lot of requests that I could meet. So she just took that program and ran with it and created herself a position by writing grants with uh, the local chapter of CAF and would bring whole classes of kids out here. She recruited and trained people to be docents. And then the docents would split the group up and lead them around the farm and do different projects. There were usually about four stations. So we would get a busload of kids every week for about four months and at a time. And um, the busload of kids would be 60 kids because they have to fit, fill up the bus. So it would be a little, a little chaotic, but really joyful too. Uh, the kids just love it. And 
Uh, so that went on for about five years, and now Aaron's off doing farm to cafeteria stuff with the, with the county. But um, for that five years, it was really a wonderful program. And like I say, it's because Aaron was really organized, and she just I basically provided the spot, and then she ran the program. That's how I've been able to do these things is because I partner with people. I don't try to do it myself. I think that's a really important point. It, it is something – that I was just going to comment on because you've, you've mentioned that throughout as we've talked about the different projects that you're doing that, that you consistently kind of pull other people in uh -huh. or maybe it's even just making room for them to be pulled in themselves. <laughs> right. Right. Because I do get approached. So we've had summer programs where people approach me and say, I would like to hold a summer camp at your farm. And depending who the person is, <laughs> um, I meet with them and I talk with them and I see what they're, up to. And if it's somebody that I feel I can work with well, I do let them have a summer program here. So it all depends on the person I'm working with and how it fits in with what I'm doing as a farm, a production farm. So Janet, could you tell us a little bit about how you actually came to Redwood Roots Farm? Sure. I was living in Arcata and I was, um, I was running a gardening business. I was doing a lot of uh, Victorian gardening in a small town near us. And I loved doing ornamental stuff, but really my heart is in growing food. And so uh, these two women, T. Griffin and Aaron Anderson, had started Red Roots Farm on two small sites away from, um, just down the road from here. And after the first year, I think they had 25 shares. Aaron went back up to Seattle where her family was living and T uh, found this parcel that the farm is on. And I joined her here the second year. Um, she ended up having a baby and not being able to continue working because the baby was little. And so I've been a sole proprietor since 2000. And how did you come to this particular piece of land? This is was well, June and Bill Thompson, who bought the land and were really interested in having it farmed, uh, put out the word that they wanted a farm here. They needed some farmers. And and you guys were just in the yes. in the right place at the right time right. with that regard. And then I was able to purchase the land, which was a big deal. How did that work? Well, um, I was not in any hurry to purchase the land because we had a rental agreement. We didn't have to pay any money for the rent. I mean, any money for the land. And so, you know, June and Bill are just very generous. And uh, so I wasn't in any hurry to buy the land. Um, but my friend, Jean, one of my original education program mentors, she is a realtor. And she said, don't wait, buy the land now. And she was very, she's like, I'll lend you the money. I had just gotten out of debt from buying my tractor. So I didn't want to go back into debt. She's like, I'll lend you the money. And she was very adamant that I should do it now. And she's a realtor and she knows the field. And I don't, I've never bought land. And But she really impressed on me that I should do it sooner than later. So I approached June and Bill and said, you know, are you ready to let go? Because I knew eventually they'd want to sell it. And they discussed it among the, amongst themselves and said, yeah, they were ready to sell. So I had to put together, a. I had a, a little bit about a money, um, but I had to put together the rest. And I, it was all personal loans. I funded everything at the farm, except for my John Deere loan um, through personal loans from shareholders. Wow, that that's really impressive. It that is. <laughs> you've done that without having to turn around and go to the bank. Is that is that indicative of the people who are part of your CSA? Yeah, I'd say. Yeah. Yeah. People. Um, I went to the bank when I was building the classroom. I went to banks and I said, I want to build a classroom on my farm. And, you know, that's so outside their scope of what they're used to. They couldn't even hear the words. So over and over, I get over and over again. I got. You're, you want to do what on your what? Like they couldn't even hear my words. So I thought, well, banks really, do, it doesn't seem like that's the route I should go. So once again, I reached out to my shareholders. I wrote a letter and said, I want to borrow this amount of money to make this classroom, which will be a community resource. It'll have a library. We'll do classes. You know, it will be a warm structure for us. And uh, sure enough, I um, some shareholders lent me the money. And then about five months into paying it, turned around and said, we're gifting you the loan and we're giving you back the money you've paid us and you need more money to uh, 
furnish it. So that was just like a dream come true. I'd never had anything like that happen before. And Carol and Rick Greeny, I'm going to say their names because they were just so awesome and generous. So that was a huge, that's one of, that was the hugest gift the farm has ever gotten. And then everything else was a loan, which I paid back. You know, we had real reasonable payback rates. And so do you own the farm outright now? I do. Yeah. I paid it off in four years. Wow. Congratulations. Thank That's you. Really great. It's a big deal to me still. And it's been years, but it's a real big deal. I, you know, being from Michigan, I never thought I would be able to afford land in California, especially such a sweet spot. It's just so beautiful. I wish you could see it. I'm looking over it right now. I wish you could see it. And it's just, I'm appreciative every day and really kind of pinch myself every day too. <laughs> I don't take it for granted. <laughs> And are you making a full-time living from the farm now? I am now. I uh, worked off-site uh, for the first 10 years, maybe. Um, once again, doing fancy gardening in Ferndale, a nearby town where I made a really good wage and I'd go off-farm once a week. And now, in the last six years, I have been able to farm solely. So um, that feels great. I really enjoy just having it focused here on the farm. It really is such a treat when you when you don't have to go. Yeah. All right. Well, with, with that, Janet, I think this would be a great time to take a break. We're going to get a word from our sponsors, and then we'll be right back. Okay. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is made possible with the generous support of Vermont Compost Company, makers of Fort V and Fort Light potting mixes. Vermont Compost potting soils are a really special product. I used Vermont Compost Fort V as a blocking mix and potting soil for over 12 years on my farm, and we grew great transplants with it. And I mean really great transplants, year after year. At a time in the organic movement when we're seeing more and more companies jumping on the bandwagon, Vermont Compost is a reminder of the art and the craft of making potting soil. They mix an incredible diversity of ingredients into the compost that forms the basis of their potting soil, incorporating many kinds of manures along with plant materials and food wastes to foster structure and aeration in the compost. I love that they're Fort V-Mix even has chips of ocean blue granite in it and kelp for a little smell of the ocean. One thing I've always appreciated about Vermont Compost is their ability to put out a consistent product year after year. And in something that's subject to as many variables as market farming, it's nice to have something that you can count on. VermontCompost.com. This episode of the Farmer to Farmer podcast is brought to you by BCS America. BCS two-wheel tractors are often mistaken for just a rototiller, but it is truly a superior piece of farming equipment. Engineered and built in Italy where small farms are a way of life, BCS tractors are built to standards of quality and durability expected of real agricultural equipment, the kind of dependability that every farm needs. On my own farm, we went through a number of so-called solutions before we finally got smart and bought a BCS. Even though we owned a four-wheel tractor to manage our 20 acres of vegetables, that that BCS tackled jobs that we couldn't do with the larger machine, from mowing steep slopes and around trees to working in our high tunnels. Whether you're looking for a rototiller, power harrow, rotary plow, flail mower, snow thrower, sickle bar mower, chipper, log splitter, or just about anything else, you can run it on a BCS. Check out bcsamerica.com to see photos and videos of BCS in action. It's pretty cool. bcsamerica.com. And we're back with Janet Zarnicki from Redwood Ro- which is this I've been I, I've actually edited it out so far, but I've been stumbling over this name all day. Redwood Roots Farm there. See, I'm from Seattle and we don't move our lips when we talk in Seattle because we only use the back of our mouth and, and it just it bogs things down. So Redwood Roots Farm in Arcata, California. And Janet, so it's my understanding that you were actually involved in in founding and and kind of shaping one of the first CSAs in the country. Yeah, I wasn't a founder. Um, Community Farm of Ann Arbor was founded by Marsha Barton and Cindy Olivas, and I joined them the second year. And uh, so I was part of shaping it in the early days. And I was one of the farmers. There were three and a half of us, and we had a couple apprentices. And it was at where I lived. So at that point, I was living where I was farming. And uh, it was the fifth or the sixth CSA in the country. It was around 1987, 1988. And Ann Arbor, of course, was a great place to start something new because the community in general is open to new ideas and uh, they took to it just really rapidly and it was an on-site on-site pickup people came out to the farm we had a you know member uh, a group that you know whatever what do they call it they just the uh, core group the core group we had a core group and people came out to the farm and it was it, the distribution was in a beautiful old red barn typical of the midwest with beautiful stonework so it was a really beautiful site and um 
And I also had another job at the same time where I uh, worked with people with uh, mental illness doing a gardening program. So I've mostly had more than one job as I've been going through this farming journey. And then at some point you you left. I did leave. My relationship split into a million tiny pieces and I decided I needed to get the hell out of Dodge. So I came back out to California and I worked, I traveled, I ran out of money and worked some more and then settled in Arcata and um, started a gardening business because I had those skills and I could get to work right away. And that developed into a really good business, but my heart was still in farming. So when I had the opportunity to join T the second year with Redwood Roots Farm, that's what I did. I love hearing the stories of how people actually get to their place, you know, because it's, it's so often it's not a straight road. It oftentimes looks like it is from the outside, but definitely circuitous. So Janet, Redwood Roots does, I mean, you do vegetables, but you've also, I mean, when I, when I go through your Facebook page, oh, I mean, there's tons nut, of pictures. Yes. Yeah. Of flowers. I know it's, it's a love of mine and it's really grown the love, this love and passion for growing flowers over the last few years. Um, I love growing food. That is my number one love. I will always grow food for people. It's just super basic to my reason for being, really. And But I really got into flowers because they're beautiful, for one, and because they're a lot trickier than vegetables. So I really am still challenged by some of their uh, sowing needs and germination needs. And I we've been increasing the number of kinds of flowers we grow and increasing where we grow. And it, it kind of all started um, with my mentor, Dennis Tamura of Blue Heron Farms, giving me dahlia tubers. And I fell in love with them. And uh, now I do more and more and more. And the neighbor gave me some dinner plate dahlias and I put in two more lines. And so, um, and then I have a friend who joined me. She does most of the designing. And so now we're doing events and weddings and things like that. Very small scale, but it kind of adds another, it does add another um, income avenue. And, and another dimension to the farm. Yeah, it really adds the beauty. I mean, people gasp when they see the flower garden. They come around the corner and they see the garden. Uh, right now, it's just seedlings. But when it's in its full glory, August through October, I mean, people literally gasp. And they come here to see the flowers. And you mentioned you're doing weddings. Are those happening on your farm? Yeah, we're only doing two, though. It's not very, I don't advertise it. It's not on my website, but it's such a beautiful spot that with the right client, it's perfect. We don't have electricity. We're off the grid. So it has to be someone who likes that kind of thing. And so the two brides we have this year are really easygoing. They're good with not having electricity. They're fine having a little generator. And they're doing both their weddings and the receptions here. Okay, so now I got to pivot away from flowers because you said no electricity on the farm. That's correct. We're off off the grid. And so, but solar, wind? Nope. Or nope. So you're not just off the grid. They're, you're just like off. Yeah, we do have propane. We have an outdoor kitchen where we cook lunch for each other every day. So we have an outdoor kitchen and I get propane for the stove. And uh, we get our water from the neighbor and he has uh, solar and so the pump is um, that we lease from him is powered by solar power. And how how do you get your produce cold? Well, we're on the coast and my wash station faces north. So it never gets really above 50 degrees in there. The only thing I can't hold is broccoli. So we just cut on the day that we need it. But everything else we can hold in that 50 degree wash station. Wow, that's. Yeah. I know. Sorry. Uh, you know, as, as, as the post-harvest handling and food safety guy, that kind of gives me the heebie-jeebies. But, why, you know. why is that? What do you think goes bad? Well, I just, you know, in my experience, getting things cold fast oh, is well, such a critical we, element oh, of, yes. of getting the we get them getting it to last. We get it cold fast. We use cold water. But, right. But, you know, you, but you're not getting it below 50 degrees. I mean, your water out there can't be that cold. It's cold. It comes from 200 feet down. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. And then generally, because people buy on site, like they come here, we don't pick, we pick rarely before two days before, I mean, rarely, we only pick up to two days before it's, we're not holding things for a week. Okay. Does right. That, does that make you feel so, better? It does. It does. <laughs> you know. Two days? Um, 
Well, still, I mean, it's just it is it's it's a, it's so interesting to me because for when we got our walk in cooler, it it revolutionized things on my farm. And it was something that that because I'd always farmed on farms that had walk in uh-huh. coolers, yeah. you know, where we were holding things at at 32 or 34 degrees. It was it was so hard to farm without that. I, just, I, I know. I know people do. We do. But it's not it doesn't it just doesn't fit into to the way I think about. Well, vegetables. we just don't hold things very long. We pick it right before we distribute it. And it, that yeah. works for us. I mean, it's it's simple. Well, and I guess, you know, it's not, you're not dealing with Midwest summers right, where, exactly. you know, I mean, I imagine that a lot of times your highs are the equivalent of our lows. Our, our uh, highs in the summer, we consider it really warm at 75. Really? Yeah. On the coast. That's On the coast. Just so you know, just so you know, that's not warm. <laughs> well, I'm hoping you're feeling better than as the compliance for, for yeah, food safety. Well, <laughs> well, and of course, from the food safety perspective, what we're always worried about is, is bacteria growing and multiplying that, you know, at, at higher temperatures. And that, I guess that would remain a concern, but I also think that's kind of a secondary issue. I mean, more what I'm concerned, what I would be concerned about is quality of the product that you're presenting to the customer. If I was putting my consultant hat on, you sure, know, but sure. obviously that's working for you. It is. We pick our loose greens on the day they're distributed. So they get dunked in cold water, they get spun, they get put in big bags and they get distributed at the same day. Now, if you're not getting temps up over 75, or if that's a if that's a really warm day there in 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 the Humboldt area, what's how are you getting tomatoes? Okay, so first I want to clarify we're on the coast, so all we have to do is go 20 minutes inland and it's 90 degrees. So it's only because I'm on the coast that it's so cool. Inland Humboldt gets really really hot, so there's that, and then Humboldt's a really big county. And then we do all our tomatoes and hoop houses and our peppers and our eggplants. Okay. So all those warm weather solanaceous crops are are coming out of high tunnels. Uh-huh. Well, they're kind yeah, they're not real high, but yeah. Well, okay. So <laughs> which is why you use the word hoops. So tell me about your hoop houses then. Well, they're fifty by twenty feet and they were kit from Oregon Valley greenhouses. And I have five of them. And one is used for nursery and drying racks for garlic and onions. And the other four, we plant directly both the hot crops in the summer. And then um, in the winter, we plant for a spring harvest. So it's really tight come May. I have to, I have to flip them in about a week. So now all the hot crops are in and we use a trellis method for the tomatoes, you know, pruning it down to two liters and winding them up. Uh, twine and it works beautifully. We now have gotten it down to just doing sun golds and brandy wine because they are always so successful. And then we do about, I don't know, eight different kinds of sweet peppers and a couple different kinds of eggplant. Yeah. Well, I always feel you too with tomatoes. I mean, once you're growing sun golds, why would you grow anything else? I know they're so popular. <laughs> well, and they're so good. Yeah. You no, know, I actually had a fight. I just, funny side Chris story here, but you know, I mean, I, I live in town now. So, right. So I, I actually go and I buy my transplants uh-huh. at the, you know, at the food co-op. And, and so I'm standing there at Willie street co-op and, and somebody was asking about the, the tomatoes. And I was like, and I finally, I just couldn't, I couldn't handle it anymore because they were asking staff people. And I'm like, look, you need to buy the sun golds. And she's <laughs> like, well, how many? I'm like, well, as many as you got room for because they, you know, and, 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 and my, my wife laughed at, she laughed. She was like, afterwards, she's like, I was wondering how long you were going to be able to keep your mouth shut before you had to jump in yeah, on that. Yeah. Sun golds are really, really worth it. Well, and I think when you grow them in the high tunnel too, you know, sometimes when you grow them outside that, you know, you end up with, with fairly small fruits, but when you do them in the, in the high tunnel, you have so much more control over all of the cracking issues uh-huh. that you have yeah. with those and, and then you get much bigger fruits. Yeah. So it's like the, the economics of the whole situation changes yeah. too. Yeah. We are experimenting with outdoor peppers and eggplants this year. We just put out a couple beds and we'll see how they do. I'm not putting in black plastic or anything. I'm just growing them like every other crop in the field. So we'll see if they set fruit because we have low night temperatures. You know, they it definitely di- dips below 50 degrees at night. So we'll see. I just am experimenting. I experiment with all kinds of things. And you said no black plastic. Is that a 
is that an economic decision? Is that an ethical decision? It's more ethical. I don't want to deal with it. I mean, we have to deal with the plastic when we change it on the hoop houses. And right now I'm looking at a big piece that I can't bear to take to landfill. It's just sitting rolled up in my CSA shed. So um, I go back and forth. Um, we've considered going to black plastic with strawberries. And I talk about it with my crew. And um, we did some black plastic years ago, but I really don't like dealing with it. Yeah, that's that's why I sold my plastic layer. Mm -hmm. I just didn't like it. Yeah, yeah. You know, it worked. I just didn't like it. Yeah. So tell me a little bit more about your production system there on the farm. Well, like I said, we have five acres in production. About a third of that is in production all year round. And with the winter crops in the winter. And uh, right now we're about mm, three quarters of the way planted out. And then I'll do some double cropping and triple cropping even with short season varieties and certain beds. And uh, we use a bed system. It's about three and a half foot with foot and a half paths. They're all formed with a tiller and they're all flat. I didn't need to do any raising. We have pretty good uh, drainage and there's four rows. Um, so it's, it's densely packed in the beds. We have, uh, you know, concentrated production and, um, we do most of the cultivation with a with hose. Um, I've gotten a lot better over the years with timing, so we catch most of the weeds when they're quite small, and it's a real quick sweep through with hula hose and or precision hose. We plant by hand, um, and we. When you say a pre, when you say precision hoe, what like those what li- kind of hoe like are you talking about? Like those little collinear ones. Like the collinear ones. Yeah. Okay. And so, you know, once in a while things get away from us, I will till in about it if I think it's going to take too long and just re-sow. I will. Sometimes we do do some hand weeding. I really work really hard at timing it right so we catch the weeds when they're little. That's the main idea (laughs) with weeding. And so I'm always, I mean, I, well, I did a lot of work with tractor cultivation Uh and, and. But it's really interesting to me. You you're not using wheel hose, and you're not even using well, even on that five acres. We, you're not using the. We do use a wheel hoe in the pathways. Okay, it, but not in the not in the beds. No, in the beds it's usually hula hose. Wow, interesting. And and how do you decide whether you're going to use the hula hoe or the colonial hoe? Well, uh, we usually run through with the hula hoe first, and things like brassicas. If the leaves have gotten a little big, then we'll go through with a little hook. A hole so we can get very close to the stem. Okay. And, and then, um, and so people are just going through and you've got one person in one wheel path and one person in another wheel path doing each doing half the bed or they doing the whole bed. Uh, well, I don't, I like it when people spread out and don't get in each other's way. So usually we do at least eight beds at a time in a block. And so I'll have them take their own bed. So they're not getting each other's way. And people are able to reach across that entire bed uh-huh. with the yeah. hoe. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And and I know that we always struggled with getting employees to do a good job. I mean, it, you know, it seems obvious, right? How to use a hoe. Yeah. You know, you want to you want to get it underneath the dirt. You want to disturb things. But you know, it, it was one thing when we was like go out and go after individual weeds. But I would be another thing to actually get people to, and especially when you talk about the timing, to really do a good, thorough job. Have you found any tricks or hints in communicating with your employees about that? Well, I usually, at the beginning of the season, do demos. I'm real big on demos, and they all know that I'm, my standards, like, (laughs) I have, I'm, I'm very picky and I have high standards and they all know that, but I think most of my crew, I, at this point, I do a lot of recruiting of the people I want to work with and a lot of them come through the intern program. And so they know me, I know them, we know we like each other, we know we like how how each other work. And so I've been getting higher quality of workers over the years and now it's just amazing, really. And so they all have similar standards and are, take a lot of pride in their work and do really good work. So there's very little quality control that I'm doing anymore. Uh, it's really nice when you when you can get to that point. Yeah, it's taken years. I mean, a lot of it that has to do with me and how I train and learning how to train better and learning how to recruit better and all that kind of stuff. Because I think workers, the crew is only as good as who's directing them. Laura Masterson spoke to that and I wholeheartedly agree with her. So what have you done to learn how to train better? (laughs) 
I do a lot of reading. Um, I get read books on management. I read the New York Times business section. And you wouldn't think that that would apply to here, but, you know, people are people. And so even in, in a corporate setting, people want to be treated the same way that they would on a farm setting. People want to be treated well. And so I've done a lot of reading. I do more training than I used to. The first two weeks when the crew starts, uh, we spend most of that time in training where I go over all the systems. We talk about what we want to get out of the season and talk about kind of touchy feely things, what, what we're hopeful for, what we're scared of, and really kind of break down some of the walls that, uh, you know, keep us separate so that we're working as a unit. Um, I think there's a real big feeling of it's, it's their farm too. The crew really feel takes ownership. I like how this really is a is part of the same theme that you talked about with the CSA members. Right. I mean, it's really about about setting up a relationship right. that is reciprocal. Right. Exactly. So then, with the you know, you've got the weed control. How are you doing your seeding and your and your transplanting? Uh, the seeding is all done with the Earthway and. I, Everything I buy, I take really good care of. So we've had the same Earthway for like the last 14 years or something. Oh, my God. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I know. I take really good care of stuff thanks to my grandparents who went through the Depression. So I got that value from them. And uh, so I do all the direct seeding with an Earthway. And then the transplanting is done by hand by the crew. And they're really fast now. They're really, really fast. I don't think a transplanter could be faster at this point. And are you marking, are you dibbling those, oh, those beds for well, transplant? This is my favorite tool. One of my favorite tool answers is we have a hand pulled dibbler. It's made from wood. We call it grandpa dibbler because it's getting old. We got to be real careful with it. So we have this dibbler. We just pull down the row and that marks uh, the lines and dibbles where we put the plants. And what kind of a transplant production system are you using? We grow our seedlings in the nursery in 192 count rigid cell trays. Most of them, okay. most of them. So, and when you talk about the rigid cell trays, those are the ones that, that you can drive over with the tractor yes. and they're going to be okay. Yeah, we've had those for like 15 years. It seems like that's the kind of investment that you like to make. I do. I like to buy really nice things and then keep them kept up. You know, I keep them, I, we treat them nicely <laughs> so they hold up. Yeah. Well, and interesting to me that you were making those kinds of investments before you were full time on the farm. Yeah. If you're going back 15 years, you said it's only been six years that you've been that yeah. you've been full time farming. Yeah. Well, um, you know, the intent was to get full time farming. So that's how I was I was moving toward that in my mind. <laughs> What are you using to actually work the soil? You said a rototiller, but that's mounted on the back of the tractor, or is yeah. that a walk behind unit? We have, we have both, but the beds are made with the tractor, um, the rototiller on the back of the tractor. Okay. And then, are you doing much work with cover crops in your climate? Yeah, we do a lot of cover crops. Uh, in the winter, I use a mix of usually oats, sometimes rye, but usually oats, vetch, peas, and bell beans, um, and. I mow them down. I do have a flail mower that I mow them down in the spring and then can um, till it right in. So our soil, we have a great soil. We have a clay loam. It's along the creek. It, I can work the I can work brassicas in with just my rototiller. I don't even need to mow them. So it, the ground is just very um, receptive and it's a beautiful, beautiful agricultural soil. Now, is there a lot of agriculture in your area? Well, mm, yes, there is. We have Humboldt County is well known for its grass-fed beef, its uh, pasture-raised uh, dairy, um, and there's a big bulb farm in Arcata. And then, um, but we have a lot of beef cows, a lot of dairy cows. We have the vegetable farms are focused. Um, there's about, I don't know, five on the coast. And then inland along um, the Klamath River and the Trinity River are the inland vegetable growers that, you know, bring in the hot crops, the peaches, the tomatoes, the corn. And so we have a good mixture of coastal vegetable growers and inland gro vegetable growers. Okay. And what are you using for fertility on your farm? Between the cover crops. Um, so everything that isn't in production over the winter gets a cover crop. And then we also use composted manures. Over the past few years, we've used composted chicken manure that we get in. We, we buy in. 
Are you just using a manure spreader for applying that? <laughs> okay, now I'm going to get made fun of. Uh, I dump it and the crew spreads it. They fling it and then I till it in. Wait, wait, they fling it. <laughs> yeah, they fling it. Okay, so tell me how this works. With shovels? Because I think, you know, okay, well, uh, <laughs> okay, right. I'm, good, I'm glad that you don't have them using their hands, but but I mean, so when you say you dump it, I mean, are you like are you, grabbing it with a bucket on the tractor yeah. and then just putting it out in the yeah. field and then they just kind of fling it around? Uh-huh, and they do a really good job of distributing it. Right now, the way I'm set up, I would have to change my bed system if I wanted to use a manure spreader, and it's worked so far this this all these years for them to fling. So I try to keep things really simple. I don't want to add machinery. I don't want to add more complexity than there already is because there is quite a lot of complexity with the amount of vegetables we grow and the different kinds of plants we grow. And so um, the crew is fine with it. They, you know, probably in total during the whole season, it probably doesn't add up to any more than 20 hours in the seven months they're flinging poo poo. So it doesn't really take that long. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, once again, I check in with them. They're fine with it. If, if I got a lot of grumbling about it, I would probably change my bed system and go to a manure spreader. Um, I, I mean, they're great. Manure spreaders are great, but uh, the, the crew's fine with it. And, and I guess, I mean, again, flinging poop at 75 degrees is entirely exactly. different than flinging poop at 95 degrees. And really, most of it is flung in the spring. <laughs> oh. And then are you dealing with a lot of uh, insect and disease pressure? Well, on the coast, because it's so moist, you know, between the rain and the fog, we have a lot of fungal issues. So I'm always um, being really careful about when I irrigate. So I irrigate first thing in the morning and we make sure our hoop houses have really good airflow and that our nursery has good airflow. So I'm really always keeping my eye out for fungal issues. That is a big deal on the coast. And then we have a big flea beetle pressure, cucumber beetle and some phylum. Ah, some violence. Some violence. Okay. So I mentioned I grew up in Seattle. Yeah. And, and, you know, there was a time when I thought I wanted to farm in Seattle. And, and you know, between land prices, it, it really did come down to land prices and some violence. Yeah. And I was like, and I read a book and they were talking about the some violence. And I'm like, I'm like, I don't think I want anything to do with that. Give me, give me cucumber beetles. Give me flea beetles any day. Right. Right. Yeah. They're tricky. I've come to really respect them. <laughs> And maybe you could tell us a little bit about the symphylins. Uh Well, they're naturally occurring decomposers in the soil. They're related to a centipede. Um, they're soft-bodied, so they're dependent on already existing passageways in the soil to move through. They can live as long as six years. Uh, they eat organic matter, which, of course, organic farmers are adding organic matter if they're good organic farmers every year. And they will also eat... Um, so the problem we had was with them eating uh, the carrots, you know, the, the carrot would send out the radical and the symphylin would eat it and we'd get no carrot. So that's how we noticed we had symphylin was I, we couldn't get the carrots to germinate. So what do you do about well, that? Well, I came up with a whole management plan. I first I did a massive amount of amounts of research and read everything I could. And then I actually did some research on farm with a, a Humboldt County organic farm advisor that we had for three years. And then I came up with a management plan. So one thing I'll do is where there's high symphylum pressure is I'll plant potatoes because they don't bother the potatoes. So we'll have potatoes planted throughout the field in odd places, but they grow and I get production out of that. Uh, I threw some dahlias, not surprised. I threw some dahlias in there, a couple um, beds that had bad some phylum. And because, you know, they're tubers too, and they're growing beautifully. Uh, I'll put in, we, we would grow Sudan grass, which would grow. Um, I'd take it out of production. Sometimes I would do seed bombs where I would plant so many seeds that, you know, by hand broadcast like cilantro and dill that there's no way that some phylum could possibly get all that. And then we'd get, you know, it'd be, uh, chaotic, but we'd get cilantro and dill that the shareholders could you pick. So I did a whole number of things. They don't, they, they tend to not like, uh, like we put our herb garden in where there's high symphylin pressure because they have all those essential oils that, that symphylin don't tend to eat yeah. those things. So I've just worked with where the hotspots are and kept good track of that, even though they move from year to year. But, um, yeah, so there are parts of the field that are, you know, I really have to do something different than what I ordinarily would do there. So it's, it's an issue, but I've been dealing with it for so long. It, it doesn't 
phase me much anymore. And it did at first, you know, the second year when we discovered it, I thought I couldn't farm here. And I thought, oh no, but uh, I've learned to work with it. And you mentioned the fungal diseases. What are you doing for control of the fungal diseases? Well, I don't do anything. I don't do okay. any sprays. We, because I think, because I'm careful in terms of irrigation, uh, we get, we have fungal diseases, but they generally don't grow. They don't become a problem. Interesting. So really just making sure that you irrigate early enough in the day that you don't end up with that long wet period on those leaves. And that we have very good, uh, and we make sure we have really good airflow in the hoop houses. How do you do the good airflow in the hoop houses? Well, they're 50 foot. So all we have to do is open the ends and we have great airflow. We've never had an issue. I have a friend locally who has a hundred foot hoop houses and he also doesn't have electricity and he gets these dead spots and massive fungal growth right in the middle. So I'm really happy I went to the 50 foot length. And do you have roll up sides on those tunnels too? No, because... It only gets 70 degrees. Only gets 75 and degrees, so in, right. Inside, yeah. when it's 70, 75, it's only 90 degrees. And the, of course, the tomatoes and eggplants and peppers love that. Huh. I, again, the inter, I mean, always so interesting to hear what other people's climate challenges are. I know. Are. It's really different, you know, because I, I farmed in Michigan, too, and it's it's so different. Being on the coast, it's just, I'm used to it now, but it, it I had to learn a lot at the beginning. Okay, so, I mean, now we've just been talking about pests and diseases and stuff, so I think this is really a good time to introduce the topic of family. So you you haven't mentioned a partner in, in our whole conversation. Right. I haven't had a partner recently. I was married at one point in my younger life, but uh, over the last few years I've been single and I've been farming alone s since T had her baby in 2000. Wow. And I'm, and I'm just curious, I mean, I – is that a good thing? Is it something you wish was different? I mean, is it is it a is it by choice? Um, I don't know if it's by choice because I've maybe part of it is. I mean, I think part of it is meeting the right person, and I'm at the point in my life where if it's not the right person, I'm not interested in just dating for dating's sake. Maybe when I was younger, but at this point in my life, I'm very busy and yeah. satisfied and my life is very full. And so if that right person did come along, certainly I'd be open, but mm, I'm not looking for it. Let's say that. Yeah. Have you found that, I mean, you know, a lot of farmers obviously, yeah. and, and I would say most farmers have a partner of some sort. Yes. Um, yeah. You know, I would too. And have you, have, do you feel like there's advantages to being a single farmer? Well, I do know my friends who farm with their, uh, partner, they really have some issues to work out about who does what and, you know, how they make decisions. And I see them struggling with that. And that I don't miss. I mean, I really like that I can just make a decision myself and I don't have to go over and over and over and who's going to have the ultimate decision. But, um, and I really like all the aspects of the farm. So I really like doing everything. Like I love the tractor work. I love the nursery work. I love the field work. I love the CSA work. So I like doing all those different parts. Um, and, I, you know, there's advantages and disadvantages to having a partner on the farm. And right now, you know, I've been the sole proprietor for so long. It's very natural and it feels comfortable. Yeah. All right. Great. So with that, I'd like to turn to our lightning round. Okay. And I mean, you've already told us what one of your favorite tools on the farm the is. Dibbler, the dibbler, the hand, the hand pulled dibbler. So tell me a little bit more about, about the old dibbler. Grandpa dibbler. Well, it's, I got it from um, a model that my friends up in Oregon have, and it's just a wooden wheels on an axle that we pull, you know, it has handles and we pull it and it marks the rows in the holes. And it's just, you know, it takes 30 seconds to run down the bed. Does it actually mark the holes yeah. or does it, does it make, does it make them so that you're just dropping the plant in there? Uh, it, it marks depending on the state of the soil, you know, whether it's chunky or whether it's smooth. Um, sometimes it actually makes the holes and other times it just marks them. So you, we really have to make the hole with a trowel. Okay. And, and I'm just curious, how important is it with your hand weeding system where you're just using hoes to, to have really straight rows or is that just not such a big deal. Oh, it's for you. a big deal. <laughs> I think people are a lot more efficient 
if it's uh, nice, even rows. So, and plus we do use the little tiller in the pathways to cultivate. So the pathways don't get, and also like when I go to work a bed to till it in, if the bed next to it's crooked, it's a mess. So I'm really big on straight rows in, in a productive production system. You mentioned you, you do a lot of reading. It sounds like. I do. Uh, <laughs> what's the last book that you read? The Lean Farm, which I loved. <laughs> that was like it was a great book. I was so excited because it's really how I think. And so when I saw there was a book like that, I was just so thrilled and got it right away. And um, in implementing some of the, you know, the whole thing about not having extra things around, I really like that idea. And um, yeah, it was, uh, there's yet more things to implement, but yeah, that's the last book I read. Great. And what's your favorite crop to grow? Well, it's kind of funny because it really is a solanaceous family and it doesn't grow so well on the on the farm. But I just love the way it looks. I love the way it smells. I love the fruits. I love everything about it. So including potatoes, I just love that whole family. I love to eat it. So that's my favorite crop to grow, even though it doesn't grow that great here. What do you do to take care of your body? Ha, that's a really good question. Well, um, I really don't go out in the evening anymore at all. I don't socialize in the evening, so I make sure I get really good sleep. Uh, that's so important for me and being able to get through the day, the whole day, the long days. And I try to eat really well. Um, it's easy to do on a farm. Um, so I try to eat well and I sleep. And this winter, I joined a gym and started to do regular kinds of exercises I'd never been part of a gym that was interesting so I've been doing that and uh, I really um, we're really careful in general about body mechanics and how we lift and how you know changing sides when we're hoeing and getting help if we need it and things like that and if you could go back in time and tell your beginning farmer self one thing what would it be well I think it would be to not work as hard by asking for more help. It's only been within the last five years that I have been readily asking for more help. I just think that's such valuable yeah. advice. I worked so hard and I think I just a little more help and I wouldn't have had to work so hard, but there was something about doing it all myself or I don't know what, but I'm over it and I'm glad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can relate. Yeah. All right. Well, Janet, thank you so much for being on the Farmer to Farmer podcast today. This has been a, a really fun conversation. Thank you, Chris. It was awesome talking with you. All right. So wrapping things up here, I'll say again that this is episode 70 of the Farmer to Farmer podcast. And you can find the notes for this show at farmer to farmer podcast.com by looking on the episodes page or just searching for Zarnicky. C-Z-A-R-N-E-C-K-I. If you enjoy the podcast, I'll bet you'd enjoy my weekly email newsletter, The Flying Rutabaga. You can check that out at farmertofarmerpodcast.com or purplepitchfork.com. Also, please head on over to iTunes, leave us a review if you enjoy the show, or talk to us in the show notes, or tell your friends on Facebook. We're at Purple Pitchfork on Facebook. Your reviews and referrals make a huge difference in our ability to reach out to a growing circle of listeners. One more thing, I appreciate so much all of the guest suggestions that I receive through the suggestions form on the farmer to farmer podcast.com. Please let me know who you would like to hear from. I'll do my best to get them on the show. By the way, Janet is one of those people who somebody wrote in, said, hey, I want to hear from her. And I tracked her down and we got her on the show. Thank you for listening. Be safe out there and keep the tractor running. 